Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. I want to go through a few stories that uh, came across my desk this morning, and I want you to see if you can figure out what they all have in common. First, Greece is rioting. These are the police in Greece. More violent clashes as youths throw rocks and gas bombs at the Greek finance ministry over the cost-cutting measures being taken by the government. They bombed a satellite truck, they blew up kiosks, they attacked police. The protests and strikes have brought the economy to a grinding halt. Everything from the electric company workers to ambulance drivers to air traffic controllers to public transportation employees, they all walked off the job. Greece is lovely today. We told you about this two years ago. We said it was coming. Nobody believed us then. There's much more coming. Okay, there's story number one. Now, similar strike is set to hit the UK on Thursday. Up to three quarters of a million workers plan to walk off their job on Thursday. So there's another nation. Now, let me take you back in time just a little bit. This is the Israeli ambassador who was shouted down while speaking at students at UC Irvine. They wouldn't let him speak. Let me go now to the conservatives that speak on campuses. They're often silenced, and Coulter has been physically attacked on stage. Then we have the president's spiritual advisor, Jim Wallace, who has several groups that have targeted Fox, this program, uh, hate talk radio, through groups like um, Sojourners and Faithful America and Faith in Public Life. There's a whole bunch of them, and they attack through commercials. Although when you go to their websites, you always see, it's, it's, I mean, it's painfully obvious that they are mere political arms of the DNC and the Uber left. Soros funds many of these. And I've often been puzzled. He's an atheist. Why would he fund faith groups? I've questioned Soros, speaking of him, how many, how many times has he attacked us through Media Matters? They had a little party for our departure last night. Media Matters, first of all, our departure is Thursday. Um, but uh, just know, enjoy that party while you can. You'll be praying for these days to come back. How many millions has George Soros spent to silence me? Now, silencing people is what they do best. If you dare to be skeptical on global climate change, and according to the scientists, um, maybe you should be branded. This is from the LA Times. I, this has got to be a joke. Surely it's time for climate change deniers to have their own opinions forcibly tattooed on their bodies. I'm not necessarily saying on the forehead, I'm a reasonable man, just something along their uh, arm or across their chest so their grandchildren can say, really, you were the ones who actually tried to stop the world from doing something? And why exactly was that, granddad? You know, there's nothing better than thinking about your grandchildren coming and seeing something tattooed on your arms. That's, no, it's, it's always good even to joke about. It was the same line of attack on health care. If you disagreed with Obamacare, it was because you were a racist, you were a hate monger, you wanted to starve children, not because you believed in small government or entrepreneurs, right? Do you remember? Those of you who are watch, watching certain uh, news channels that, you know, on which I'm not very popular, <laughs> and you see folks waving tea bags around, Waving tea bags. Why did he say that? Why did he do it that way? Now the Obama administration officials are hiring mystery shoppers to pose as patients to find out if doctors are accepting patients with private insurance while turning away those in government health programs that pay lower reimbursement rates. Of course they are. We told you this would happen. They knew this would happen. What's amazing about this story is uh, this really is the mark of the death of the free press. You see, the press is supposed to be the watchdog. But if you don't have the press, well, then who is it? Well, don't worry about it, because now you have the government being the watchdog. You know you don't have an honest watchdog when the president said that doctors are out amputating legs or feet or taking out tonsils just for profit. And the press didn't expose those doctors or expose the president for lying to the American people. Because only one of those things can be true. But the press just went away. So now the government can be the watchdog. In Wisconsin, protesters continue to chant, this is what democracy looks like. But here's what it really looks like. Listen to what they're saying to a Republican state senator as he's being chased by hecklers around the Capitol building. 
now protesters are going around and mobbing banks and other companies. The government employee union is sending letters to businesses asking them to support workers' rights or else. They put up signs like this one in their windows. It supports workers' rights. If you don't, well then here's what happens. Failure to do so will leave us no choice but to do a public boycott on your business. And sorry, neutral means no to those who work for the largest employer in the area and are union members. Do any of the, are you seeing a pattern here? The unions did the same thing to Philadelphia, a locally owned coffee shop, a little coffee shop, didn't use a union outfit for some of the renovations. They had thugs stand in front of their store every single day with signs saying the coffee sh shop was harming their community. Welcome to the third grade, gang. You, you don't agree with me? You don't agree with me? Well, then you must hate teachers. No, no, I'll tell you what, you hate teachers and firefighters and cops, and you want to starve children to death. Get them! That's what we're turning into. What do all of these stories have in common? Mobs. We're turning into a mobocracy, and they're doing it to the whole planet. <laughs> Why? They don't, need to, they don't need to tear us apart if we'll tear each other apart. We're being taught to hate each other. From the teens in the street to union workers to college liberals to politicians, businesses, at some point, your views are going to be challenged. And are you part of the mob? Or are you on the other end, the one that's surrounded? And if you are that person, how are you going to react? Tonight, we begin the search for courage. Hello, America. There are only three shows left. The last show of, of this broadcast on this network is Thursday. There are only three shows left. Tomorrow and tonight, I, I want to talk to you about a couple of things um, that I think are important, and then a very special show on Thursday. Um, after that, I'm going in a new direction. I told you that last year. Go to glennbeck.com and you'll see what I'm doing and where I'm going, and please stay in touch. But tonight, I want to spend one of the three on the start of a search for courage. Because courage is a, it's a process. We're not born courageous. We don't, we don't, you know, we're not babies. And we're like, God, I'm the super baby. I'm so courageous. That doesn't happen. It's a process. And it's a process that includes a lot of things. Education. Education even knowing on who you are as a person. It requires honor. That's why last year we started with restoring honor out at the um, Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. But now it's about courage. Whatever shape or form it may take in your life, you have to have honor and courage. But whatever it looks like, I can tell you that real courage will never be found in a bag or a bottle, a bong hit, or in the comfort of a mob. Courage only counts and only is real when you are alone and when you have to dig deep inside and truly question, what is it that I believe? What is it I'm willing to lose? How unpopular am I willing to be? Courage doesn't really happen when you are in a giant crowd shouting whatever it is you're shouting. I have friends and acquaintances that I think are amazing people. Um, amazing stories of courage. Marcus Luttrell is one of my good friends. I consider him a brother. Marcus Luttrell is the author of the book and soon, I think next year, to be a movie, um, The Lone Survivor. It's really not about him. It's about his courageous brothers in arms. He was part of a SEAL team. All of them were lost except for him. He was left severely wounded, dying of thirst, and stranded in a remote, rocky, rough Afghanistan mountain region, surrounded by Taliban, all of which wanted to finish the job. 
that man has courage. And he's not alone. Almost every member of the military I've ever met has that kind of courage that I don't even begin to understand. This last weekend, um, I met somebody. I took my son, because honestly I didn't want to go take him to cars because, yeah, it's got an agenda. Um, and he was all excited to go to cars, so I had to bribe him with a Yankees game. Um, so I took him to the uh, Yankees. And something happened with a wounded vet, Michael Kaser. Um, at the Yankees game, this guy caught a foul ball. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. He reached out and caught this foul ball with his hat. On Sunday, I had the chance to walk with him. I went on a five-mile walk with Michael, and we had a chance to talk, just the two of us. He told me the story about how he lost his arm while serving in Afghanistan. He told me he has a lot of survivor guilt. God bless this man. He survived a massive blast. He was the only one able to walk out. He was wounded so badly that if you see him up close, he has scars on his face. His jaw was broken in 20-some pieces, and he was ripped from ear to ear. He actually had to lift his jaw up and hold it in place to say, please put a tourniquet on my arm. Um, as we were walking, and he was describing these things, I told him, I said, I, 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 I said, Michael, I don't know if you've ever seen Schindler's List, but I'm afraid, or um, uh, Search for Private Ryan, but I'm afraid I'm the guy on the stairs that can't go in to do anything because I'm so terrified and so riddled with fear. We talked about courage for a while. And then I talked to him about why he got into the service. He said he really didn't really have any interest until he was a, he, when he was a kid, he went to his dad's base. His dad was in the military. And he saw an instance, uh, incident where somebody was right in front of him and started to have a seizure. He said, there's my dad in his uniform, and he reaches down, and he took charge of the situation. He started barking orders, saying, you got to get this, give me this, quick, go, go, go. And he said, it was then that I saw my father in a completely different way, and I wanted to be like him. He wanted to be like his dad in the end. I think maybe that's the only thing that we really have of value, something to leave our children. We leave our children, hopefully, if we do things right, with a bigger vision of who they can be because they have a chance of seeing that in themselves because they saw us striving to be a bigger vision of what we could be. I don't really honestly know um, what my kids think of me. I know they love me. I, I think they respect me, um, and I think they're proud of me. They, I know they don't want to do what I do. I know they don't question what I do, but they fight to be normal. They fight to understand what's going on. I have two children that are in college and then younger ones who don't understand yet. I can't relate to what it's like to be Marcus Luttrell or to be My uh, Michael reaching out and catching a baseball with your hat and, and not being bitter about everything, having the courage to even go over there. I can't. It's so far and above and beyond anything that I have experienced in my life um, and most likely above and beyond what you would experience in your lifetime. But we are going to have to find the courage within us at our own level because we are going to have to deal with people calling you a hate monger, a, a, a racist, uh, um, pointing you out, surrounding you on the street, uh, whatever. People calling you names. The New York Times did it, called anybody from the middle of the country a Neanderthal. I, just, I don't understand it. I'm not sure exactly what it will look like for you, but I know you're time to need courage is coming. Just like I said last year that your time for honor is coming, and it is. And those two are put together. You must be a man or a woman of honor and let your children see it. You must know what you believe and then have courage. The key is not being able to um, fight back. The key is how you deal with it. Do you deal with it with, with courage and dignity and honor? Honor? 
If I may, I'd like to give you a small, almost meaningless example in the grand scheme of things of what we will all go through. Last night, I decided to take my family out for a nice evening at the park here in New York City. There's this great park, um, and they show movies uh, on the, um, in the park, and people grab their picnic baskets, and they've been doing it for years. And they grab their picnic blankets, and people lay out in a beautiful night, and then they watch a movie, and the sun goes down. I have always wanted to do this. Ever since my daughter was about this tall, I wanted to do it. A couple of weeks ago, my daughter and I were walking by, now she's in her 20s, and we were walking uh, by this park, and she saw that they were showing a Hitchcock film, one of my favorites, The 39 Steps. My daughter and I are both fans, and I have talked to her about doing this for a long time. So we decided to grab the family, grab a blanket, and we headed out to the park last night. She went out early, about the time this broadcast was going on the air last night, and she grabbed a spot. I arrived around 7 o'clock. It didn't take long for the comments to begin. Now, I get it. I'm Glenn Beck. It's New York City. I'm used to getting comments. Uh, I didn't go into this one blindly. It comes with the territory. But not the territory for my children or for my wife. You would think that there would be some common decency, especially among the culturally superior here in New York. But it didn't take long for people to start whispering pointing and pretending they weren't taking pictures and texting and posting. It really felt as though it was um, closing in on my family. My wife said, do you want to go? And I said, not on your life. I'm going to watch this movie with my daughter. It started to build, and the next thing you knew, people, this one woman, actually stood up and pointed her finger at the four of us and said, we're in New York and we hate Republicans. I wanted to tell her, so do I. We have so much in common. <laughs> um, I didn't respond. Um, she yelled at, she yelled at us, that actual comment. You'd think that I'm kidding, but I'm not. Now, this particular group of people behind us were obviously drinking. Um, and I, I get that. I'm sure they're not usually that overt with their hatred, but boy, it was out in full colors. But here we were surrounded when my wife and daughter decided they had to get up and go to the bathroom. Now, this is, oh, gee, I don't know, halfway across the park. How did people even know halfway across the park? And that's when a man, as they came back um, and told me, with my daughter with tears in her eyes, that another man stood up and pointed at them and shouted, we hate conservatives. It wasn't too much longer that so the um, people that were sitting behind us accidentally um, spilled um, a alcoholic beverage all over our blanket, all over my wife's back. Um, they laughed about it. I thought to myself, boy, mom and dad must be proud. The people all around us were taking pictures. Uh, this was, um, these are the pictures that were um, posted online before the sun even went down, before the movie even started. You'll notice the courage that it took to take some of these shots of my family. They just didn't want anybody to notice that we were taking pictures. Why not? When the movie ended and we got up, um, I got up just a few minutes before it was over. And uh, my wife and I started to walk out, and I left my daughter and her boyfriend there on the blanket. I regretted it as soon as I got up, because the crowd started to jeer and applaud that we were leaving. Again, I wanted to point out that that's what people do at the end of a movie, but maybe it's just me. I regretted it when I got up, because I realized I was leaving my daughter. grossly outnumbered. I can handle it. But I was shocked with the complete disregard of my family. When I got home, my daughter text, texted my wife to apologize. It was about midnight. 
I called her back up. She was embarrassed and saddened. She takes pride in New York and New Yorkers, as I do. She apologized and said, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't know it would turn out this way. And I told her it's not her fault. All throughout, I thought to myself, I needed to bring one message to you. I want to share that with you next. Last night, um, I was here um, in New York City, and this isn't a bull pork land kind of moment. This is actually to speak to you and tell you that you need to have courage. We each serve our time. Um, we each are going to have to stand up for what we believe in. Um, your time is coming, but we also have to make choices as we're with crowds. Um, are you going to behave like we behaved as people and Americans on 828? Um, or are we going to um, behave differently? We have to be able to live together, no matter how much we disagree. I disagree wildly with people like Van Jones or the president. But all I could think of as I was sitting on that blanket last night was this. I had to beg you that if you ever find yourself on a blanket or in a restaurant or any place next to a guy that you vehemently disagree with, be it Van Jones, Michael Moore, it doesn't matter. Don't kick your beverage on them, and certainly not their wife. Don't become them. The woman behind me kept shouting about diversity. It didn't ever occur to her that she has become everything that she claims to despise. They were the bigots. I have gay friends. I have gay co-workers. I have gay employees. I have minority friends, I have minority co-workers, and I have minority employees. I have wildly progressive and liberal friends, and employees, and co-workers. I don't not hire them because of their viewpoint. I don't shut down their rights or shout them down in the hallway. That's not who we are. My company is run as a team. Our country needs to be run as a team. Isn't that the way we're supposed to be? That we agree on principles and values. These clowns didn't even realize what they were doing. They're becoming what they despise. While they were shouting to me about diversity, they couldn't even handle the fact that someone near them didn't agree on their policies. If your lack of tolerance begins at diversity of opinion on policies, you might want to re-examine your beliefs and your courage. Last night, when I talked to my daughter about midnight, I said, honey, we have to love them. We have to love the people that were so angry. She was hurt and angry last night. She said, Dad, I don't even know how to do that. <clears throat> this is not the first time that uh, my family has had to deal with this. And it's not the first time that she has had to deal with this. She has seen her father put on a bulletproof vest in America far too many times merely because people disagree with my opinion. I actually surprised myself last night. The anger only once welled up in me, and it was quickly squelched. And when I was on the phone with her, I told her, Honey, most of the people that were there were good. It's the few bad apples that did it. However, there were those good people who remained silent. Nobody said, hey, just knock it off. Let them be. Just watch the movie. That's where courage comes in. The ones who did the hating, I told my daughter, this is where you begin. Feel sorry for them. I really felt sorry for them. I will pray for them. Because they have no idea. They're creating a world 
that they're not going to like when they're finished unless they're in the majority. They better not ever deviate. When they're finished creating it, they're going to see how much anger and hatred has built it. And maybe they will start to recognize that they were simply pawns. They didn't have anything to do with anything other than they were being used by a global corporation like General Electric or special interests like the labor unions or politicians, the Democratic Party or George Soros. Oh, they hate the wealthy so much, the wealthiest of the wealthy. And when they wake up, it may be too late for them to get out. Pity them. Love them. Pray for them. Don't strike back. The term blind hatred is such an amazing term. Because that's what hatred does. It makes us blind. When I felt that anger start to well up in me, I could s see less. Before you know it, you're trapped. What I do want to tell you tonight is thank you. I celebrate, I celebrate the fact that tonight, after two years of meeting here at this time with you on this network, I can with full confidence come to you and just say those two words, thank you. Thank you for not being, <laughs> thank you for m me never doubting that you are not driven by blind hatred or motivated by rage. I don't have to tell you not to kick your drink on somebody's wife's somebody's wife's back you'd never do it I know who you are thank you we're back um, in New York and Preston uh, and his uh, and his wife are here and they are uh, where you live now in Pennsylvania Pennsylvania um, but uh, you were born here in New York, right yeah. in the Bronx, and you were. And you, you said that it, this is the, the story I just told, and I agree with you, is not New York. That's not the way New Yorkers are. They're not. Um, and these these people, these were the um, the young, arrogant cultural elites. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but they they actually somebody came up and tried to get me to sign a deal uh, to in, in this in this time in our country's history. They actually were passing around a form signing um, uh, to ask the city or demand that the city actually spend more money on arts in the city. And I really wanted to stand up and say, who's a taxpayer here? Who's a taxpayer here? Who's a taxpayer? Um, needless to say, I didn't, I didn't sign that. Um, David, you're from San Francisco. Yes, sir. And you have got to have been in these situations before. Yes, physically I've been roughed up. Uh, during the anti-war protests, I was trying to present a humane case for getting Saddam Hussein to surrender quickly, and people in San Francisco didn't like that. And, um, How do you mean you were roughed up? I was handing out a little flyer that I wrote saying, well, now that the war has started, we can't stop that, but let's try and get Saddam Hussein to surrender quickly. So you on the left who don't like needless bloodshed, let's write letters to Saddam Hussein and get the media and press to get him to surrender quickly so the war bloodshed will be over quickly and the people of Iraq can be liberated quickly. What happened? They told me that I was evil and wrong and started yelling at me and then started to jump me and take pull all the papers out of my hands. The police came and protected me, which was great. Thank you, San Francisco police. It's very typical. And I'm sorry to say, in our lovely city of San Francisco, there is such intolerance for a diversity of opinion that unless you march to the left, they don't let you march. It's, it's really amazing how we are in a culture where people are saying celebrate diversity and yet they don't, they don't notice that unless you are this particular color of the rainbow, you can't be in, I'm sorry, you are not in it. You have to be silenced. You said now the, the exact opposite is Texas. 
Yes, I was just with some Texas folks over the weekend, and they told me an amazing story, and that was when the San Francisco Giants played in Dallas, and we won, won the series. All the people in Texas in that stadium, or at least a great majority of them, stood up and applauded, as proper sports people would. They're good losers, you've never been to, you've never and they're been good to, winners. You've never been to Philly, has he? No. <laughs> we were, you know, when I was at the Yankees game, I was talking to my wife, um, and we were talking about Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, because um, the Colorado Rockies were playing. And I happened to have um, one of the guys from the Colorado Rockies stop by the radio show, and he was in our green room, and um, he said, you know, I just uh, want to say hi and blah 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 and so we were talking for a while and uh, I said huh excited about the Yankees I said that's got to be a good feeling huh he said anything anything is a good feeling other than Philadelphia <laughs> he said that is one I believe he used passionate uh, town that wasn't exactly the word that I would have used uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to some of the fans there is there I mean, what, what, how do you correct this? You're in Philadelphia, and the, and the fans are brutal. What do you do? As a citizen, what do you do? Anybody? Stay silent. What's that? Stay silent. They boo Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Philadelphia may not be a good example. <laughs> You know, uh, um, we had this debate in our, um, in our meeting this morning when I came in, and I... I told the producers, I said, I, I don't understand it. Um, I said, if I would have been in the exact opposite situation, I would have so clearly said, knock it off, you losers. If I were in, if I were in Texas, in the exact opposite, and, and, you know, Van Jones was on a blanket with his family, and people started treating him like that, I would have said, knock it off, knock it off, because it's the, it's the bully mentality. But everybody stood silently. Now, the debate we had was, well, if you say something, then does it turn into a melee? So what do you do? Yes, Anne. What I was going to say was the thing that came to mind when you were speaking was actions speak louder than words sometimes. And what I was hoping you were going to say when you ended your story was that there weren't many that were able to say much. But they may have surrounded your family just by their presence to let you know no. that they were there and sometimes there are no words to explain bad behavior no and you don't need to explain you don't need to explain um and that's why i wouldn't get up last night and leave because my actions would have spoken louder than words mm -hmm. um as 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 grueling as it may have been i'm sorry i'm not going to reward terrorists mm -hmm. And that's really what happened on a very small, minute scale. That's what that was. That's what these mob scenes are. Mm -hmm. That's what, what are the people in Greece? They're terrorists. They're tearing things apart. And they want you to be afraid. What would uh, Gandhi would have done? I mean, he probably would have... Gandhi wouldn't have been on the blanket watching <laughs> Hitchcock movie. <laughs> he would have said, we don't have any salsa. What do you mean we don't have salsa? <laughs> Yes. In those formats, though, you did the right thing. I mean, in, when a mob breaks out, you can't necessarily reason with a mob, especially a, right. a mob that's drunk on liquid courage. I mean, that's a different type of courage. People are very brave, you know, when they feel surrounded by a mob or when, you know, they're intoxicated. Look at sporting events. Same, same thing there. People aren't reasonable. Yes. But I think, I think the thing that's really sad about it is that no one stood up for you. Yeah, but uh, I'm not convinced no, that everybody, but, even everybody even knew, you know, it was... Well, just... they may not know what was going on, and they may yeah. not have realized it, but the, the truth of the matter is that you go back in, in, in any type of history, and you allow that simple minority that then pursues violence to start attacking an individual I, I will or tell a family. You that, I will tell you that uh, the, the um, most somber moment, and most likely just for me, was when a, um, a Orthodox Jewish man was trying to make his way through the crowd. And he stepped on the blankets, and then he looked like, there's no place for me to go. And I reached over, and I grabbed the blanket, and I pulled it back, and I said, go ahead this way. 
And that moment, and he didn't even mean it this way. It was just that image of him looking like I, I don't know where to go. And that, I think, is what you're talking about in a, in a grander scheme of um, that when silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. If if you you stood there and, and in a way you made your position by saying nothing, by remaining there, by, by defending your right to be there. But if somebody, just one other person around you, would have stood up and said, you know what, as you said earlier, just leave him alone. He has every right to be here as much as we have the right to be here. Just knock it off. But we've gotten so politically correct, we're afraid to do that. Yeah. We're afraid to have that. And nobody really likes conflict. Right. Nobody likes well, I mean, conflict. conflict. I don't think you could have said something because it was directed at you, and the, the person to defend you could only say knock it off, because if they started having an argument, it would have started into oh, yeah, a, no, it would Everyone have been. would have been shouting, yeah. yelling, throwing stuff. They can only say knock it off. We're watching a movie here. I, 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 did, see, um, I, I did see something at uh, 828. I don't know if you've ever seen the video of this. It's, it's a remarkable video. Um, it's some people that dressed up as conservatives, but you knew they weren't conservatives because it was so, it was like a cartoon conservative. You know, it's like, what do conservatives wear? <laughs> and, um, and they came out and they were being the most obnoxious, most blatantly racist people I have ever seen. And it was so transparent. And um, it was one of the things I worried about when we were planning 828 last year in the mall because I knew that there were people that wanted that strikeout. And um, I was so proud of the people that were there. They surrounded these people and just said, that's not what we believe and that's not what you believe. We'll pray for you. <laughs> we'll pray for you. Would you like to pray with us now? I mean, it was, they had no place to go except, oh, crap. <laughs> Jeffrey. A Mark Twain quote, to be good is noble. To show someone to be good is nobler. I think you did that. No. No. <laughs> no. no. I just went and I watched it. I watched yeah, the movie. But you last did the time. right thing. You did the right thing yeah. and, and let them Yeah, they do what they want. Back in just a second. You know you have the winning hand when you don't have to go to a third grade argument to win. Um, and the arguments are so ludicrous. Um, it's really getting to, I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but it really is. Look how far, uh, how far the left has to go to, per, per, uh, to paint a conservative as a hate monger. I'm going to show you now something that happened, I think, last night. More people are going to see this clip than has seen this show in a whole year in the next couple of seconds. Here is um, uh, Chris Matthews responding to Michelle Bachman who had the unmitigated nerve to praise the founders. Watch this. We have to recapture the founders' vision of a constitutionally conservative government if we are to secure the promise for the future. What is this, Michael, the Protestant Re Reformation? <laughs> that somehow we're going back to the purity of the original Christian church. No, no, we're going exactly. back to the original perfection of slaveholders and how perfect they were. And government is the enemy. Yeah, government is the enemy. Um, show me the great, great government that, that uh, has been big uh, that hasn't ended up being oppressive. Show them to me, will you? Um, here he is jumping through hoops, and he's ignoring the creation of the greatest country the world has ever seen, ever. He ignores the brilliance of the Constitution, the power of the Declaration of Independence, skips all of that, and declares that Michelle Bachman must have meant that she wants America to return to slavery. I know you are, but what am I? Come on, Chris, please. Let me ask, um, how many are conservatives? Oh, my goodness, there's no diversity of thought here. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. How many want to return to slavery? Oh, come on. Surely there's got to be somebody that wants to return to slavery. Okay, we want to return to the founders in the Constitution. But how many want the Constitution without the amendments? You Surely you don't want the amendments. We'll just leave that off if we return to the Constitution. No amendments, right? Who's with me? Isn't one of the amendments that we stop slavery? The only one that I would like to overturn is the IRS one. <laughs> but still, you wouldn't... 
How would you how would you do that? If you wanted to change the Constitution, how would you do that? Can anybody tell me? Go ahead, tell me. Constitutional convention where you have three quarters of the states ask for it. You don't want the Constitutional Convention because that will open everything up. up. Or you have or two thirds of Congress and then it goes three quarters three three fourths of the state legislatures. Okay. So you want to overturn This is what it would take under our Constitution if you wanted to return to slavery, which is an absurd idea. And everybody except, I don't know why Michael Steele was laughing at that. Everybody um, who's watching that, who has an honest heart, knows there's nobody that wants to return to slavery. You would have to go, get a bill drafted, get it through Congress, get it through all of the states. Come on. That's not going to happen. George Soros couldn't make that happen. So what is that all about? What is that clip really about? It's vilifying. Go ahead. It's a very common tactic. It's vilifying the messenger and and making them uh, seem as if they're ludicrous or they're racist and delegitimizing them rather than the message or the policy that's being advocated. So listen, when Uh, that we showed this clip last night another clip like this about rick perry where they said i don't even know what he's uh what Uh, self-reliance what i mean the the things that we have always every president every party on both sides of we've said both the republicans and the democrats both say we're like they're lying to us they don't believe that but they've always said it now they're not even saying it it's not only doing a sarah palin to michelle bachman It's immediately labeling her a racist. She wants slavery, which is ridiculous. But it's one other thing. We'll get to that next. All right. We've been talking about courage uh, tonight and the importance of having courage. We only have two shows and seven minutes left, two hours and seven minutes on this network for me to share with you what I think is important. You cannot have courage, or it's ridiculous to have courage, if you don't have a conviction. What are you fighting for? What are you fighting for if you don't have something that you're committed to? I can guarantee you, you you see this with your friends all the time, and maybe you have done it too. You'll get into a debate with somebody, you'll be like, no, that's not true. And then they'll throw up something in your face, you'll be like, All right, well, yeah. You don't have any more courage because you don't know if you're right. Right? Courage of your convictions. Now, how do you get convictions? The other thing that they were trying to do to Sarah Palin there is to throw the Constitution under the bus. Because most people don't know the Constitution. Most people don't know why it was even written, why it's important. Make the case for the Constitution. Can you do it? Make the case for the Constitution. You know how you have conviction? I think it's a three-step process. You, one, educate yourself. You, two, you question everything. Don't take it from me. Don't take it from anybody else. Question everything. Even the things that you really truly believe are true. Don't just let them sit there. The third. Anybody guess? Repeat one. Educate yourself. Because we're growing. The things that I believed two years ago. The things that you believed when you started watching this show two years ago. Do you believe the same things? Some things. Some things you don't. Are the things that you believe today that when you started watching the show two years ago, you would have said, if I would have introduced you to the Bob of the future, you would have said, no way, Bob. Bob's never going to believe that, right? Yeah, absolutely. You educated yourself. You questioned everything. But then things changed that made you see things in a different light. And you went back and you educated yourself again. It's the only way we can have courage is to know what we believe Know what's worth fighting for. What's, in the grand scheme of things, what do you actually stand for? On tomorrow's program, I want to share some things with you. There is a report uh, that is out now from uh, CBN. This report says, can you put this up? 
uh, this report says that analysts now in Washington are worried about the Arab Spring because, well, it may have some unintended consequences. You don't want to miss tomorrow's program. The last regular broadcast of this program is Thursday. We'll see you tomorrow. Back in just a second. Final thought. We have two shows remaining tonight and tomorrow. Tell all your friends and make sure you're joining us tomorrow and Thursday for the final episodes here on the Fox News Channel. And sign up so we can, we can stay in touch with each other. Go to glennbeck.com right now. From New York, good night, America.